Welcome to our deep dive today. We're tackling febrile seizures. And uh, you know, we know you're all dealing with this in your practice. So we're going to go kind of beyond the basics. We'll give you the most up-to-date info and hopefully some insights that uh, maybe you haven't thought about before. Yeah, we're going to really try to dig into those little nuances of this condition. It's really common, but it can be a little perplexing sometimes. It can be. Right. So let's start with a quick reminder. What exactly defines a febrile seizure? So these are seizures that happen in kids 6 to 60 months old. And crucially, with a fever, but without any signs of infection in the central nervous system. Okay. Right. And just to emphasize how common this is, they are the most common seizure type in those under 5. Absolutely. I mean, every pediatrician, every family physician will see this. You know, and understanding how to classify them can really change how you approach these cases. So let's break down those categories. You've got simple, you've got a complex ax, mm -hmm. and then there's that febrile status epilepticus, which is a little more worrisome. What are the key features that distinguish them? So simple febrile seizures are usually brief. They last less than 15 minutes, um, and they're generalized. That means they affect the whole body, and they don't come back within a 24-hour period. So if you're seeing a child who's having a short generalized seizure and it stops on its own, that's likely to be a simple febrile seizure. Exactly. Okay. Now, complex febrile seizures are a little trickier. They might last longer than 15 minutes. Um, they might just involve one part of the body, or they could recur within that 24-hour window. Okay. And then there's febrile status epilepticus. That's a whole other ballgame, right? Yeah. Much more serious. Yeah. This is when a seizure lasts for more than 30 minutes, or if a child has multiple seizures without regaining consciousness in between. And that's a tree emergency, requires immediate aggressive intervention. Now, I think there's a common misconception out there that it's simply a high fever that triggers these seizures. Right. What's really going on there? Well, the fever is a key ingredient, um, but there's more to it. The current thinking is that there's a genetic predisposition. So family history increases a child's risk. It can, yeah. Viral infections are often the triggers for that fever. Things like the flu or just the common cold. But you're saying it's not always viral. Right. Bacterial infections like ear infections can also cause that fever that triggers the seizure. Um, even some vaccines have been associated. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Although it's rare. So it's important to get that detailed history. Absolutely. Including your vaccination status. Yes. Let's talk about evaluating a child who presents with a febrile seizure. What are our priorities in that moment? So you want to think about two main goals. First, figure out what's causing the fever. And second, and really importantly, rule out serious conditions like meningitis. Yeah, meningitis can be really tough to diagnose in those younger children. Oh, it can be. Especially. It can be. Because those classic signs aren't always so clear cut. Absolutely. And that's why a meticulous physical exam is just so critical. Looking for even subtle signs, maybe irritability, a bulging fontanelle, or anything that seems off. OK, so we've got the history. We've got the physical exam. What about investigations? Yeah. Serum glucose is a must for any child who's presenting with a seizure. After that, it's really about being targeted in your approach. You know, if your history and exam point towards a specific concern, you can order additional labs. Okay. And what about neuroimaging? Is that something you'd order routinely for a simple febrile seizure? Not routinely. The American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommends against it unless there are specific concerns, maybe something on exam or if there are those focal features. Okay, so we've talked about labs. We've talked about imaging. What about lumbar puncture? That's the big question, isn't it? It is. And, you know, parents are understandably worried about meningitis. Of course. They're light to be concerned. Yeah. And historically, lumbar punctures were pretty common for febrile seizures. Yeah. So what's changed? Vaccines. Ah. Vaccines for haemophilus influenza type B and streptococcus pneumonia, they've really been game changers. The rate of bacterial meningitis has dropped dramatically thanks to these vaccines, and this has changed the guidelines. So the AAP no longer recommends routine LP for every child with a simple febrile seizure. That's right. But there are key exceptions. So children between 6 and 12 months who haven't finished their vaccinations for those bacteria should have an LP. Okay, that makes sense. We need to be more cautious in those who might not have that full immunity yet. Are there other situations where you'd consider an LP? Yeah, if a child is already on antibiotics when the seizure happens, we can't always rely on the exam to rule out meningitis. You know, those antibiotics might be masking some of the signs. So an LP is a good idea in that case. Okay. And of course, complex febrile seizures and febrile status epilepticus that would always prompt an LP. 
Absolutely. In those cases, the risk of missing meningitis outweighs any potential downsides of the procedure. So it comes down to a careful assessment of each child's individual risk factors and that clinical picture. Let's move on to management. I imagine a lot of febrile seizures are over before the child even gets to the ER. You're right. A lot of times the seizure is over by the time we see them. But there are definitely situations where we need to step in. Let's start with those prolonged seizures lasting more than five minutes. What's our go-to treatment there? Benzodiazepines. So something like diazepam or lorazepam, they're crucial in those cases. 5 e administration is the best, but if you can't get IV access, there are other options. Things like buccal intranasal or even rectal administration. And what about febrile spatus epilepticus? Obviously much more serious. It is. We're talking aggressive management often with multiple medications to get those seizures under control. Parents often want to know if there's anything they can do to prevent these seizures. So what do we tell them about antipyretics? This is a key point. While acetaminophen or ibuprofen can help bring down the fever and make the child more comfortable, they don't actually prevent febrile seizures. So even if you bring down the fever, doesn't mean that seizure risk is gone. Exactly. Okay. And that's important to be clear about when talking to parents. Right. They often think if they can just control the fever, they can stop another seizure from happening. Okay. But it's just not that simple. And what about long-term anticonvulsant therapy? Is that something we typically recommend? Generally, no. The AAP guidelines advise against it. The risk of side effects from these medications is often greater than the potential benefit especially when you consider that most kids with febrile seizures do great without any long-term treatment. So it's about reassuring parents and following those evidence-based guidelines. Let's talk about prognosis. Parents are always worried about long-term consequences, especially the first time their child has a seizure. What can we tell them about what to expect down the road? So the good news is most children who have a febrile seizure have excellent outcomes. They don't have any lasting neurological problems or cognitive impairments. That's reassuring to hear. But what about the chances of it happening again? About a third of children will have another febrile seizure. Okay, so recurrence is a real possibility. Are there any factors that make it more likely? Yeah, the younger the child at the time of the first seizure, the higher the risk. So one-year-old is more likely to have another one than, say, a four-year-old having their first seizure. And I know another big worry for parents is the risk of epilepsy. What do we know about the connection between febrile seizures and epilepsy? The risk of epilepsy is slightly increased after a febrile seizure, about 1 to 2 percent, compared to about 0.5 percent in the general population. It's a small increase, but we need to be upfront with parents about it. Are there any factors that make that risk higher? Yes. Children who've had complex febrile seizures have a higher risk of developing epilepsy, about 6 to 8%. And a family history of epilepsy also increases the risk. So again, these classifications help us kind of stratify that risk yeah. and have those conversations with family. Exactly. We want to be honest with parents while also providing reassurance and emphasizing that for most kids, a febrile seizure is a one-time thing with no lasting consequences. Now, in terms of management, when do we need to admit a child to the hospital after a febrile seizure? Well, most can be safely discharged home after observation once they're back to their baseline. But there are some red flags that would make you consider admission. Absolutely. If a lumbar puncture was done, we typically admit the child for observation. Febrile status epilepticus also requires admission, so we can monitor them closely and manage that. And are there any findings on exam or in the child's history that would make you lean towards admission? Yeah, any concerning features that suggest maybe a more serious condition would make me want to admit them. So, for example, if a child is not back to normal mentally, has focal neurological deficits or signs of increased pressure in the brain, we'd want to observe them in the hospital. This has been incredibly helpful. Really unpacking all those key aspects of febrile seizure management. I know there's always more to learn in medicine. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Just to reiterate, febrile seizures can be scary for everyone involved, but most of the time they're not dangerous and they go away on their own. It's good to remember. Yeah. With a good evaluation, the right treatment, and a lot of empathy, we can help families get through this common childhood experience and make sure their children do well. Well said. And with that, we come to the end of our deep dive into febrile seizures. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Keep learning, and we'll see you on the next deep dive. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, 
feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.